And there you go. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, this is, um, uh, you know, I wanted to welcome everyone to uh, our second event here in Florence uh, of our lecture series uh, for the fall 2021. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for everyone that was able to join us online today. Um, uh, I really appreciate everybody's commitment and work uh, to be able to make this uh, event possible. Um, uh, this is um, it's something that we've been sort of uh, focusing on to, to make this sort of online forum to continue to come together and develop ideas of how we want to position ourselves as designers, thinkers, and individuals within contemporary discourse. Um, uh, as in, in the readings that Ivie uh, gracefully shared with us, uh, we're reminded that to be able to attend to this shared community uh, and the growth of our community, it takes work, uh, a lot of work uh, and personal commitment. Uh, so I'm very thankful for all of you here today, um, um, as well as for all of the team here in Florence that made this possible today. Um, I want to thank today in particular uh, Jennifer Hag, uh, which unfortunately is not uh, connected with us online, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I want to stress how her commitment and care for the program um, is unparalleled. Um, it is thanks to her that we are continue to be able to articulate new versions of this abroad experience in Italy, uh, to think critically about what it means to look at the Italian political, social, and cultural landscape to instantiate this approach with new arrangements of travel as well as new spaces of discovery across Italy. So thank you, Jennifer, if you're ever going to listen to this recording ever again. <laughs> um, but today, um, I am really thrilled to be able to welcome Ibiye Camp from the Royal College of Art in London. Um, a multidisciplinary research uh, on the role of, sorry, I'm going to mute. I want to mute someone because it's too loud. Sorry, uh, sorry, Anna, uh, Anna Keva. Um, um, so, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, from London, our multidisciplinary research on the role of technology and digital mapping practices um, in relationship to the built environment is a great way to support and inspire the research team of our team here in Florence on the Bonifica. Uh, the term itself. Uh, which roughly translate in English to reclaim um, as a complex history. Um, one that is tightly connected to the environmental narratives that developed through history, as well as to issues of representation of specific cultural traditions, um, especially when these representations are deployed to form ideas of dominating cultures against marginalized or less than civilized ones. Um, in the last few weeks, we have been encouraging our students to articulate their research, um, uh, being critical of the sort of fragmentary nature of these sites, um, as well as the multiple overlaid histories that coexist across these territories. Uh, all the while, hopefully, trying to be conscious of their own personal background uh, that is brought into the picture when engaging with this, with their object of research. Um, uh, so in that term, um, EBS investigations on the complex nature of un urban landscapes, uh, their multiple always embedded and coexisting narratives are an incredible source of inspiration for our team. Um, our experimentation with visual and mapping practices as active agents in shaping the cultural landscape of the built environment are fantastic resources, uh, resources for our team. Um, pushing us to question the representation tropes and with those, the kind of value system that we inadvertently reproduce within our own practices. Um, so to make the most of the coordinated sort of uh, slice of time that we have across many, many time zones here, um, I'm gonna try and keep uh, her, her intro short, uh, but I'll make sure to copy the link to today's event on the Zoom chat. So if anybody wants to look more into it, uh, they can feel free to go for it. Um, uh, Idie Camp is a multidisciplinary artist, 
um, her work investigates technology and the built environment. Uh, Idea's practice uses architectural tools to create video, augmented reality, and 3D objects. Her past projects in Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and Ethiopia investigated the dynamics of technology as a means to explore the glitches and tensions between digital infrastructures and the landscape. Ibia's artwork has been presented at the Victoria and Albert Museum in, in 2016, the Porto Design Biennial in 2019, the Saraya Architecture Triennial in 2019, the Triennial in Milan in 2020, and we can keep going because she's incredible. Um, and we're very, very happy to have her uh, join our series. Uh, so thank you again for your willingness to join the conversation as well as our online community. Thank you so much um, for the introduction. Um, and I'm really happy to be here and, um, you know, I kind of fascinated with, with um, your kind of brief um, so far, what you've mentioned of what you, you're going to be exploring about kind of reclaiming sites and representation and um, fragments of the site all, all sounds super um, intriguing. So um, thank you for having me. Um, should I just go straight into sharing screen? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to, sorry, I uh, just gave you permission. Yes. Great. Um, so I, I have um, roughly kind of a 40 minute presentation. Um, and yeah, I just um, I hope that you guys have some earphones as well, because there's a moment um, in the presentation that's more about kind of listening and kind of watching a, a kind of a, a short film. Um, so I hope that um, you guys bear with me <laughs> with this. Um, yeah, so my presentation today, um, I have named um, Systems of Resistance, and I guess um, throughout my practice there's moments which um, are of conflicting territories and also um, ways of kind of reading material and um, what that kind of means in a um, kind of uh, you know ideas of, of um, kind of looking back at the past and um, kind of um, very kind of analytical kind of look at um, Black existence and post-colonial kind of um, histories as well. Um, so, um, as mentioned before, um, I'm an artist and a tutor at the Royal College of Arts in London. Um, I co-teach with Dele Adriano and Damaso Randolph. Um, last year, our studio was named Demonic Shores, Imaginaries of Indeterminacy in the Age of Logistics. Um, we're actually yet to announce the title of our studio this year, but um, as a studio, we challenge other forms of spatial representation beyond the bounds of Western epistemologies. Examples of this are the talking drum, storytelling, food and sound, and so on. There is definitely an overlapping between um, my teaching and my practice, um, where um, I kind of challenge architectural tools. Um, I do so in video work, exploring um, visualization. And one of the main techniques that I've been using, um, which you'll see a lot in this presentation, is photogrammetry. Uh, if you're not aware of photogrammetry, um, photogrammetry um, transforms an object um, from a, a 2D digital image into a 3D model. My art practice um, kind of explores the scans by using video fly through augmented reality, but also analyzing kind of the real world environment and collects data to shape the possibility of an ex a new appearance and um, particularly to question and rethink the function of a scan. I dissect scans and create an intervention, which usually kind of creates a form of installation supported by multiple digital devices, narratives and moving image. So today I'll be talking to you about my practice and particularly um, a couple of research projects of mine. So um, I guess being British, not, um, particularly of personal histories and identity and representation of the African diaspora, um, 
I kind of play with the idea of modernization and the conflicts that come from ideologies in the Western, Western technology and in conflicting environments. Um, a lot of my work stems from personal stories and I draw from family histories to help theorize around the idea of post-colonial studies. If you have, um, if you had time to read, um, I know it was quite a long passage, which was about 22 pages, um, In the Wake on Blackness and Being by Christina Sharp. Um, she kind of um, articulates why using your own personal experience to theorize ideas, um, um, particularly in black history, um, why is it so important and how Christina Sharp kind of integrates this into literature and kind of different types of represent representations of black life um, orthography of the wake. Um, I'm just going to repeat what the meaning of the wake means, um, just in case um, you didn't have time to read it. But the wake, um, which Christina Sharp uses a lot in her text, the wake is the track left on the water surface of a ship, the disturbance caused by a body swimming or moved in water. It is the air currents behind the body in flight, a region of disruption and flow. Um, and Christina Sharp uses the term wake um, to kind of think of sites of artistic production, resistance, consciousness, and possibility of living diaspora, the wake offers a way forward. And um, I'm kind of really inspired by kind of the way that Christina Sharp uses the term the wake as a moment of design or moment of kind of reimagining space. Um, Christina Sharp also writes that I include personal um, here to connect the social forces of specific particular family beings in the wake to those of all black people in the wake to mourn and to illustrate the ways of individual lives through not absolutely by the afterlives of slavery. Put another way, I would include personal here in order to position my work and myself in the in and of the wake. The autobiographical example, says Sylvia Hartman, is not to personal stories to, to fold onto itself. It is not about navel gazing. It's really about trying to look at the historical and the social processes of one's formation as a window onto social and historical processes as an example to them. As much as my process is influenced by black um, feminist theory, black feminist theory theorists such as Christina Sharp, Cynthia Hartman and Sylvia Winter use histories of women drawing from personal own experiences where, where there is a common kind of side of oppression. And this is in a way to find redemption um, from the histories. So, way as um, Christina Sharp, but um, I'll kind of continue to, to speak on why it's important to kind of drift from personal experiences. Sorry, just need to, yeah. Um, so I'm going to present a couple of projects to you today um, that I've developed over the past three years. Um, they all stem from personal stories and explore ideas around oppression, restitution, inhabiting space, and also um, geopolitical futures with architecture. I studied at the Royal College of Arts um, in 2017 when I studied um, financially built environments, the architecture of carbon discredits. And then again in um, 2018, I studied data matter, digital networks and post-human institutions. And this completely changed the direction of my, my practice as I hadn't imagined. I found myself in a space that was kind of looking at technology. Um, so technology led me to question um, the imperialism the digital imperialism that was kind of implied into infrastructures in Sierra Leone and Nigeria and the dynamics of technology kind of means to explore the glitches and tensions between digital infrastructures and the landscape. So my thesis and um, project was called Data the New Black Gold. This was an extension of my dissertation which raised questions of imperialism in the internet and transnational organizations. Um, so there is a submarine cable system that connects Africa to the rest of the world via Europe. And today there are six individual cable systems off the coast of West Africa, 
One is called Main One. This travels from Amsterdam through to London and then to a landing point in Lagos, Nigeria. So um, the undersea fiber optic cable systems trace the legacy of the imperial trading routes. A quote, a quote from James Bridle reads, imperialism didn't stop with decolonization. It just moved up into the infrastructure level. Internet fiber optic cables around the world trace out to roots of former empires. Cables from Africa route back to their former colonial powers. So um, this kind of really struck me in, in thinking about um, kind of the type of digital networks and the actual kind of governance of internet activity in West Africa. So I started to investigate um, the digital sector in Lagos, which is currently the largest digital economy in West Africa. So data has become the world's most valuable resource. A century ago, the most valuable resource was oil. Crude oil was deemed as Nigeria's black gold. The history, um, the first discovery of oil in the Niger Delta was made by British Dutch petroleum company Shell in 1956. This is actually where my Nigerian family are from, and it's one of the key oil producing sites in Nigeria. The Niger Delta, um, in the Niger Delta, multinational corporations have laid bare unprotected oil pipelines across the landscape without regard to the property of citizens. This is a testament to the lack of investment in measures to protect and secure the infrastructure, which has led to spills and explosions that have contaminated the land and rivers. A process named oil bunkering is the hacking of oil pipelines for the purpose of capturing oil. This is carried out by the Niger Avengers, which are a group of forming neighboring villages. The Niger Avengers run oil refineries and collect oil in dugout canoes traveling through the Delta. A medium sized refinery has 20 to 30 people working on site and is approximately two to three acres and produces up to 10,000 liters of oil a day. This, is for, um, this informal refinery adds to the violence in, the, in and, and contamination of the landscape in show of power, but mostly re most refineries just kind of move production and start again. Oil companies, government and local communities all blame each other for this cycle of violence. So today, um, Lagos is the leading city in Nigeria's digital revolution and home to eight data centers. It's actually um, a lot of foreign investments within the past 20 years, predominantly from China, have happened in um, Nigeria, creating a multiple amount of mega city developments that run off privatized power separate from the rest of Lagos. Um, in one mega city is Lekki, which has a area which is allocated for free trade zone. And um, here they have the data center, which I mentioned before from a submarine cable called Main, Main One. And it's called Main One Data Center. And what's really interesting about this data center is again, that it advertises 99.99 .99 power uptime in Lagos, where it, I know Lagos sometimes, sometimes has about five like hours of power a day. This data center of privatized power has a secondary power source, a redundant configuration, multiple diesel tanks, and the capacity of over 100,000 liters. So what I found really interesting in comparing the data um, economy and the oil economy is that they both have leaks. So this was a leak that was reported um, where Google customer Cloudflare IP routes were rerouted to a Chinese telecom company, and um, and it was a it was only declared an ugly mistake. Whereas um, when something like this happens um, by a citizen, they are automatically automatically deemed vandalism and criminal. So the project kind of starts to um, investigate the imbalance and how it is exacerbated by the gap between international companies and the local population. So um, my project, um, Data the New Black Gold, explores how citizens could take control of their own data and um, what data is generated from their cities 
during this time of technological investments and development from overseas. In this project, I wanted to highlight the biases and conflicts of data consumption and the tensions between government, private corporations and citizens. So I actually traveled to Yaba when we could travel very easily back in 2019. And Yaba um, is also um, nicknamed Yabacon Valley because it's a kind of site in Lagos where you could buy anything um, technical. You could buy generators, you can buy phones, you can buy televisions. And um, this was a kind of beginning point where I wanted to think of moments of data exchange. And so we ended up going to a um, mobile phone hut where you kind of hand over your um, passport and fingerprint details in order to buy a SIM card and spaces of data exchange and how kind of um, nomadic kind of markets kind of set up every day and the kind of movement that happens in exchanging information in a very unique way that maybe bigger corporations like Google and MTM wouldn't be able to um, um, kind of um, model or, or, or kind of follow through Google Maps or some sort of um, surveillance. Um, so these are kind of the moments I started to explore, particularly in these little um, kind of mobile huts and also moments in the market. So these are kind of the studies that I started to create. Um, and you can see that they kind of come up quite um, distorted or maybe distorted is the correct word, but there's a lot of repetition because there's so much of a movement that happens within that space. So um, it, it captures the sign of the advertisement. Um, this is a mobile advertisement saying 4G is here. And um, whereas what was happening on the ground level of the street, um, this was actually a um, kind of a, a, a roundabout in the center of town. Everything else kind of turns into a ghost or a kind of just a fragment of, of the object because of the way that it's moving. Here you can see the car is kind of floating in the air. It's kind of um, misunderstood where the ground is. And so this is the scan developed a little bit further. And you can see that the geometry is quite kind of confused and it's created this very kind of um, disabled kind of fragmented um, model. This is another example of another mobile a mobile phone. Um, and what's really interesting is that there's actually quite a lot of people in this space, but because of the way the scanning software works, because of movement, it doesn't kind of pick up people as much as it would pick up a still object. And this is another. So after kind of um, doing initial kind of scans of very kind of busy markets in Lagos and in Freetown, I um, then figured out that I wanted to create um, three different types of devices that would help um, me scan um, sites. Then I looked at the types of equipment people within the markets were using. So there's a lot of wheelbarrows which have been used. And so I kind of designed these, um, these area snap devices is what I called them, where you could connect um, a kind of cheap smartphone in order to take pictures and to, to then make the models. So the first one was called ground view, look ground man, which means detective wheelbarrow in Creole. And this is an example of kind of how it would move around. The second one is eye view, which would kind of more kind of scan the actual structure. And I called it wakatantan, meaning walking and spinning in Creole. And the final one um, was bird eye view, which was called Air Force One, which in um, Creole, and it, which in pigeon, Nigerian pigeon means flying witch, which I thought was quite a funny kind of term for the structure. And this would um, scan um, kind of taller kind of buildings and signs within the markets.
I forgot to ask, was, was my sound on? Was the sound working? Uh, not, not the sound of the slides, only your, I, we can only hear yourself. Oh, okay, so there's no, okay, I, I just need to put on some sound, I forgot. Okay. Whoops. Oh, yeah. So the, was, was the sound working just then? Okay, good. Um, yes, yeah, so I used um, these handheld devices to scan the markets in Lagos and Syria, um, in Freetown. And this kind of exposed these qualities of the space and behavior of the scans. Um, they became restrictive and forms, um, restrictive of forms and different types of typologies. Um, collecting a number of these scans exposed, mo exposed modes that are not globally efficient in which there was the material resistance in the form and this exacerbates the glitch in the technology. Um, I use the word glitch very often. Um, I think the glitch is an embedded inequality in how technology works in identifying texture, color, material, and time. I'm very focused on the word glitch. As a technical word, um, a glitch is a, something that is unexpected or a malfunction. Um, especially occurring in software. Um, Legacy Russell um, writes in A Glitch Feminism, a manifesto. The glitch is a creative strategy informed by and for queer, trans, non-binary communities of color that are systematically oppressed by white capitalism forces. And I also think of the glitch in a similar way maybe that um, Christina Sharp speaks of the wake as a moment of creative production or, or um, resolution or forward thinking can happen from the wake. It can also happen from the glitch in the way that um, Legacy Russell speaks as well. So my work explores the glitch and the purposeful um, kind of what, what potentials could happen from purposely causing a glitch. It could be a way of protecting yourself and it could also be a way of not being read. Um, and um, particularly for um, people that don't want to be read or surveilled. And um, the glitch is a void and it shows the tension of technology um, of contrasting territories. Um, this is also why I suggested that you read um, In Defense of the Poor Image by Hitish Still. Um, we kind of frank and value images according to the resolution. So I, I'm quite interested in thinking about a glitch. It's not really maybe an error. Maybe it's revealing something that is already there and in embed, embedded um, bias that might already be there. And it kind of highlights things that we can't quite see. Um, so the glitch allows exposure to a space to rethink order in a space or site where you start to rethink an embedded, what is embedded into our systems and technology. Using data from these devices, I then created um, a kind of glitch digital city that is built um, and opposes Western architectural ideas of modeling. Um, so I have the film, Data to the New Black Gold, that I'm going to play to you, where I kind of take you through, a kind of fly through of um, my collected city and um, kind of what, um, it's kind of like quite an immersive video, I guess. So if you take a moment to kind of listen, it's just about five minutes. Shall I 
I kept the sound um, of the market in the piece and you can kind of hear the vendors calling for customers attention and the scenes are distorted but left um, kind of an impression of a market I guess and the pace of the fly through is also linked to the sound of my, my feet shuffling through the, the markets. And, um, you know, really, it's a, it's a very kind of speculative project, but it's also the potential is that if, you know, vendors start kind of collecting data of actually how the market runs or how kind of, you know, data is exchanged within um, these kind of um, very um, entrepreneurial enterprises, the data could kind of eventually become a commodity and it's something that can't be collected by larger corporations. And it's something that like, you know, Google, MTN, Orange Africa wouldn't have access to. And so that's kind of like the, the stem of, of the project. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll speak about my second project, which was in um, Ethiopia, um, which was called um, Sacred Forests of Ethiopia. Um, after my master's, I continued to practice. Um, this led to a collaboration with the Shaja Architecture Trinale. Um, with the glitch in mind, I began to explore how the sacred forests were enclaves of 
um, ecological intensities. And um, the Sharjah Architecture Triennale was curated by Adrian Lahod in um, 2019. Um, I'm going to read this passage, which is kind of from the curation team. Um, the Sharjah Architecture Triennale was the first major international exhibition of architecture to focus on the global south. Lahod describes the global south as not a region, it is an archipelago of islands that embody specific histories and conditions that have suffered under and survived to empire, colonialism and capitalist extraction. The concept of the architecture triennale titled Rights for Future Generations was inspired by the architect Oswald Matthias Ungers. In 1917, he proposed a plan for Berlin's entire population and would be relocated to key points in the city. The rest of the city would be abandoned and allowed to return to nature. Berlin would become, in words of the project, a green archipelago. The points would become islands of metropolitan intensity, selected to keep Berlin's most emblematic conditions alive. When the moment to rebuild arrived, as it eventually would, the archipelago would be all that was required to begin the city's renewal. The plan inspired the concept of the sacred forest of Ethiopia. Today, there are some um, 8,000 sacred forest churches in the Amhama region state in the highlands of Northern Ethiopia. The forests are organized around Orthodox Christian churches and sometimes mosques. They are archipelagos of a different kind, islands of ecological rather than metropolitan intensity. The forests that surround the Ethiopian Orthodox churches are some of the most biodiverse natural forests in the world and used to, and used to cover the entire country. Much of the nation's forest land has been sacrificed to agriculture to feed the country's mushrooming population. At some more than 100 million, it was the world's 12th largest. Deforestation was particularly encouraged during the country's period of communism in 1974, to 91, when the government nationalized land, including large estates of the church. Just 5% of the country is now covered in forests, down from 45% in the early 20th century. For priests and local populations, the sacred forests of Ethiopia provide a shelter for buildings, space for contemplation and prayer and burial areas. In the past few years, small international research programs have started to document the depleted biodiversity. Conservation scientists have forged an unusual collaboration with the um, Ethiopian Orthodox Church to try to save the forest. With the re residents and the priests, they are helping to slow down the atteration. The church, to which mo more than half Ethiopians belong, views the natural forest as a symbol of heaven on earth, where every creature is a gift from God and needs its habitat. The Sharjah Architecture Triennale commissioned me to chart the unique archipelagos of surviving sacred forests and embodying alternative relations between humans and nature. The forests have survived, survived the decline of green around them by embodying different ways of being in the world, an alternative set of relations between humans and forests. I continue to explore how the communities see the forest as an extension of the church. In my practice, I try to use digital technologies to empower people and create forms of sovereignty and political autonomy, but also aesthetically challenge technology in terms of resolution, incompleteness in undigital environments. In the case of the church forest, there are a number of interesting issues that were raised at the beginning of my research. The first is the tension between aerial imagery, which was increasingly powerful in terms of conveying the sense of the land of, of these islands being archipelagos in a sea of land clearance. But also because the aerial imagery does not in the ecology of the forest, plant species or layouts or built elements such as churches. From the ground, when I arrived for a site visit, an entirely different condition emerged, one that, that is saturated with different kinds of details and facts to do with materiality, imagery, and rituals. 
when I when I visited Ethiopia, it was a very green experience walking through the surviving forests, the forests were embodied with alternative relations between humans and nature, using sound recording video and um, I charted through the forests at ground level. The video technique allowed me to um, kind of record moving trees and the cycles which kind of resist being captured, leaving an impression of the ab abstraction of the architectural detail of ritual in this unique space. Um, this is the growing environment challenged um, technology in terms of resolution and incompleteness. The incompleteness in, um, emphasizes the unique places as a typology of a system of resistance. I was a tourist in this situation, so I also wanted to have a distance to the rituals in the space. Um, I guess the models that I produced were more of an impression and I wanted to also allow the photogrammetry software to have its own geometry and kind of make up its own mind with the site and really keep it very organic and very loose with scans. So for the um, Triennale exhibition, I created an installation of zones of the landscape surrounding the sacred forest, exploring the church forest as a system of resistance. The physical elements of the installation emphasize the incompleteness of the landscape, whereas the digital elements of the installation were used to speculate the future expansion of the forest. Um, there were details of the church um, inside the sacred forests, farmlands, markets and surrounding areas and the installation kind of had augmented reality, sound, um, CGI, all sorts of different visualization tools within the space um, and as you kind of heard it had a, this really ambient sound which was kind of fragments of, of recording through different zones so if you're in one side of the exhibition you're hearing sounds from the farmlands if you're on another side you're sound, hearing sounds from inside the sacred forest and I guess um, what the models created were very um, kind of um, like like enclaves in themselves, they kind of created these like bubbles, the, the scans, and there is um, a, a, a kind of uh, setting in photogrammetry where the, photo, um, the model kind of creates its own geometry from the data that is collected. So this was something that I, I used in order to kind of create these enclaves. So you have to kind of peek through the holes of the models to really see the, um, the, the model. And this is, I, I like to show process with my work and there was a lot of testing that happened. So this is using Unity kind of behind the scenes of the disaster that would happen with trying to kind of form the digital and the physical together. It was always such a trial and error kind of process. Um, I guess this is the final project that I'm just going to show um, very quickly, which is um, called Remaining Threads, um, which I presented um, at the 13th um, Shanghai um, Biennale, which is um, titled Bodies of Water. And I found this um, the theme really interesting because it was kind of exploring um, um, kind of rituals and how kind of cycles keep everyone together and and um, I kind of, it took me back to um, the Niger Delta where my family are from, where I was thinking of how um, important kind of water is and um, tradition is. And there's a ceremony where we would play um, the drum through the creeks um, of the Niger Delta, through the, through the rivers. And um, during this, this um, ceremony we also wear this pattern and the pattern that we wear is a reclaimed fabric and this fabric is imported it's like an imported madras fabric that um, 
Calabari people, Calabari people are the tribe um, which my family are from, we pull threads from this fabric in order to reclaim it and reimagine um, because most material is imported to um, that, that part of Nigeria in Bogoma. Um, so this installation addresses the transformation of textile production. Um, what is really interesting is that Calabari craftswomen um, would um, pull, pull the thread and this process was called Pele Tebite. And um, in recent years, um, the process has actually been um, kind of now done by machines. And um, this kind of has shifted the process of the craftswomen um, where the female creative practice is now replaced by machine. This has also replaced social roles, technology, aesthetic, institution and practices within Burma. And so the, um, in this installation, I displayed um, the machine cut thread and also hand picked thread and um, scans from the um, textile factory to the ceremony. And um, once kind of a really kind of popular practice is now kind of in decline and the installation is really kind of showing impressions and traces, ghosts that once kind of po um, populated the man manufacturing process. And there's a lot of incompleteness within this installation from the pulled thread to the um, reimagined um, 3D digital models. And um, these models, kind of show the unique spaces as a system of resistance and they are very much contained within um, kind of um, the 3D um, build. And also in the installation, the beats of the Calabari drum kind of play through this space, communicating stories from the gods and goddesses and spirits of the rivers. Um, and I, this, this video does have sound, but maybe, um, it's, it's quite intense kind of drum sound, which isn't always um, the nicest to hear over Zoom. But it, it was meant to kind of bellow through the space of the exhibition. Um, yeah, so it, it was mainly kind of working from archive imagery and then reimagined kind of 3D imagery. Yeah, that was everything. <laughs> Thank you. Great, I'm sure thank there'll you. be a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, what? <laughs> uh, no, sorry, I was still muted. Um, uh, thank you, Ibiya. This is this was really amazing. Um, and like um, I keep saying uh, at the end of every <laughs> presentation, I was like, I would be very happy to have a very long conversation <laughs> with you, but I want to leave some space with um, yeah. to the to the audience to see if there is questions from the students, from colleagues, friends. Anyone at all? And like we did last time, please feel free to add questions in the chat if that's your preferred way. Uh, that's also absolutely okay. I could also play um, the films with sound if you if you want. Um, if if anyone doesn't have questions, and I'm sure there will be plenty. Some yeah. of the film. <laughs> I was going to ask a question, actually, the first um, spectacular presentation, a lot of interesting work. Thank you for coming. Um, not to make it sound like a checklist, but I, I think like, <laughs> I, it almost doesn't need saying it was really interesting. Um, and I was specifically intrigued by um, the way you quote a glitch feminism, um, which is a book that I've like almost bought multiple times and now now I have to read. Um, because that idea that like a glitch isn't a system breaking down, but it's actually just something unexpected that is implicit to the system. And that like, it, it can draw our attention to the way that even like everyday systems can like stumble um, or trip up. That was really fascinating, especially when thinking about the act of scanning in location like you were doing, because, um, I was almost, I wasn't distracted. I guess I was just also considering the performative element of you scanning, which you kind of played up through some of the imagery. 
Um, but I was interesting, interested in how you thought about the connection or duality or separation between the digital byproducts of the, that act of scanning and the actual effect of you being somebody with like a smartphone on a pole walking yeah. around in the, of the city, probably looking like you, not from around there, like you don't spend a ton of time there because that's kind of an unusual activity to have. Like, were you a glitch in that case? Mm -hmm. like what what system were you a part of if you were because it kind of seems like you're a glitch in the everyday if you're doing something like that because it just showed that anyone can come in and scan yeah what a fascinating question and like in a longer presentation um I have like kind of funny scans of of like me scanning and then my partner scanning me while I'm scanning which kind of like just shows how ridiculous the process of scanning kind of looks um and I think I was in quite familiar areas for, for myself because um, I live in Sierra Leone for part of the year. So I was like, I was scanning places that I like go to like every other day, but I would say I am a glitch in the system a little bit. Um, there's, um, you know, this, this whole project um, between Nigeria and Sierra Leone was really exciting for me because I was picking up on um, the digital like uh, kind of entrepreneurial spirit of everyone there's loads of like very informal like PlayStation huts and and you know digital kind of techie kind of um, like places within the town which kind of look like they shouldn't work at all but they do and um, there there's um, when I named the um, area snap devices, I wanted to include like kind of slang, which um, people use in Sierra Leone and Nigeria as the titles, because even in the Creole language, they include um, kind of technological terms to describe people. And there's a mobile phone where you can put two SIM cards in a mobile phone and they call it a two SIM. And um, my partner and me are both um, British West African. And so they call us two sims there, which I find really funny as well. It's like, okay, like it's, it's, it is a glitch in the system, but it's also like a very like kind of unexpected hybrid kind of like space at the moment, but with all of these like really innovative kind of um, like, kind of shops that are like selling kind of re kind of jigged gadgets and everything so I think me walking around with a smartphone on a stick it is weird but it's not like so so weird in that space it's all kind of very embraced particularly in Freetown and Nigeria like there's so much going on um that I'm I, I don't feel like I stand out as much as that like, you would think I stand out but but there is like a kind of play with kind of being um of the diaspora rather than kind of being from kind of like Sierra Leonean or, or complete fully Nigerian um which is definitely um kind of uh something that I, I include in my work and I, I want I want when I would introduce this project before I would always say that I'm coming from a two sim point of view um so that you know, I'm, people know I'm not. I'm not claiming to be like from Freetown or like kind of a Lagonian kind of um, person. Um, I don't know. What, there was another question. <laughs> I, I think I probably missed, but I think it's a really exciting question and something that like I, I sh should kind of have explained more within the presentation. How like kind of um, kind of digital hybrid like kind of Sierra Leone, well, center of Sierra Leone and center of Lagos have, are becoming. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a really fascinating bit of context that I think that I, it was kind of unfair because I had like, I think it was two questions basically that were stitched together <laughs> with lots of uh, multi-syllabic words in between, so. Yeah, I would definitely um, read glitch feminism though. Like it's really, um, I think, I think I also interpreted it in a slightly different way to how Legacy Russell um, writes it. Um, it's kind of like Le Legacy Russell's kind of talking about like your internet presence as well, uh, which is really interesting. Um, whereas I'm kind of talking about like a, a kind of more hybrid presence 
of, of digital infrastructures. Um, Thank you. Oh, Thank you, Bryce. Um, anyone else? Well, I have a question, but I don't know if, if um, Alina, if you want oh. to, to ask. Um, Wait, is that in the chat? I don't, I don't see yeah. it. Yeah, no, it was directly, but I would love to ah. have a conversation. Hi, Basundra, go for it. It's nice to see you again. Hi, sorry, I can't turn my video on right now, but it's okay. Um, no I, worries. Really, <laughs> I really love the presentation. It was incredible and um, a lot of things that I'm really interested in specifically. Um, and I think that um, looking at surveying like a lot of different data artists, a lot of them tend to be very um, clinical or maybe like just not they're very abstract in how they present their work and they talk about things that are like that. Um, and I think what I appreciate the most is how you sort of intertwine um, gender identity politics and feminism and context really in um, the way you're scanning things, um, which a lot of times with other people, they um, sort of are very removed from that. Um, and I think I am interested in knowing if these glitches and these um, um, are systems of resistance in some ways, how um, making them super contextual, how can we start to create spaces of protest and resistance in our daily lives as like the individual user of a single device and how you can do that. So um, I don't know if that was totally clear, but. Yeah, it is It is kind of like a, a protest, I guess, as well. Like, um, I think I'm really, like I'm kind of, like I, I studied architecture, but I, I'm kind of a bit of a like, kind of like, like I, I tend to critique it more than I like work within it. Um, and I think it's because I felt a bit of an outsider to the architectural language. And I think including kind of um, feminist theory and, you know, um, like, and also queer theory into like the idea of representation kind of creates a type of protest in, in the, the digital language that is used. I think digital language is, is really, um, that it's just getting better and better and better. And it, it's quite kind of, I think it's more interesting and I think it, it allows more to the imagination to kind of work within kind of um, a low resolution or like these, these spaces of, of contemplation rather than the totality of like Unreal Engine um, kind of, you know, being kind of mega, kind of like high resolution and things like that. And um, I think in the midst of, of Unreal Engine also being like free to the public, I also like question um, of, whenever something's free, you're always like the, the subject or the, um, uh, the object within it. Um, so I, I quite like the idea of working against um, these, these um, kind of platforms or the expected kind of outcome of Unreal Engine or, or like, you know, really to like kind of challenge. Um, so it is a bit of a protest in working in low resolution, working with a, a, a file that is kind of like corrupted in some sort of way or disturbed in some sort of way. Um, and when we do um, photogrammetry workshops um, um, that I do at the RCA, we tend to kind of like the first thing we, we try to do is try to obstruct the scan instead of like trying to get the perfect scan. It's just like the perfect scan is, 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 is kind of um, banal and quite kind of uh, uninteresting. Whereas when something is misunderstood, that's where the kind of project starts and, and, and you have to think, why is this, why is the, the um, object of high contrast, why is the um, object with a black surface, why is the object um, that is reflective, why are these are the things that are like misunderstood? 
and really trying to understand from that. Um, and then when you, um, there's been quite amazing artists at Goldsmiths University that have used kind of face paint and masks in order to like kind of challenge um, surveillance cameras as well, which have kind of come from understanding how scans work, which are really exciting as well. So I think um, challenge, continuing to challenge like data language and the people that are like underrepresented in data language and data visualizations is um, kind of what, what I continue to do. And um, a lot of peers as well are continuing to do too. Yeah, I definitely, that's, that's really a great point. I feel like it makes it a lot more accessible to people who feel very removed from being able to be a creator in the situation um, and always being the subject, like you said. So mm. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vass. It's always great to have you back. Yeah, I miss school. <laughs> well, maybe I'll jump in with a question because like I said, uh, it was a very fantastic presentation and um, uh, with lots of takeaways, both in your uh, verbal, uh, verbal presentation, direct presentation, but also in the kind of, uh, in the imagery that was presented and the kind of associations that came with them. Um, uh, so I, I, I guess I wanna ask, I have two questions. Um, the first one, uh, I was really uh, touched by a moment where uh, you were talking about uh, the uh, sort of the glitch city or the glitch urbanism uh, that you kind of reconstructed uh, post your kind of uh, uh, survey of of, um, of the market space, city center, et cetera. So the idea of sort of recollecting and reassembling all of these parts, uh, which um, somehow uh, I think could be a great also frame of reference for our students uh, this semester where we're giving them some version of a ex similar exercise for our survey class. But you specifically mentioned the idea of sort of going against or so sort of criticizing or maybe being critical about these Western architectural ideas of modeling. Um, and, and I was really uh, sort of caught by that sentence because of course, when we talk about ideas of composition or ideas of um, color theory or idea of, of uh, uh, all of these sort of like Western ideologies of, of design procedures, uh, those are, uh, let's say, I think there is a language there is a conversation ongoing, super ongoing, uh, exciting conversation ongoing on this. But you're talking specific about the ideas of Western architecture, ideas of modeling. And I think that this is a really fantastic sort of uh, uh, territory of like extending sort of all of those theories and ongoing sort of post-colonial studies into the space of, of basically the rhino screen <laughs> that we inhabit constantly. And so I wonder if you would be willing to speak a little bit more about that, like uh, if, like how this sort of transition between, uh, um, you know, classic ideas of, of compositional theory or color theory are translated or implemented within what you call sort of the, the idea of modeling, Western modeling. Uh, I think that's an interesting question. I think that, um... What, what I what I kind of meant by that is that I um, you know I, I have this this trouble as like a kind of bad maybe bad designer <laughs> I guess of like not being able to kind of like quite get my head around um, kind of how I would, would present my plan or section or any of these types of things. So that really with the, the film, I was kind of swinging the camera around, like, you know, um, within the digital space. I, and, um, you know, it, it was kind of a play because um, this was this was my master's project. And so I was really kind of playing with with how I could get myself through this course without kind of showing a plan and section or um, elevation or anything. And that's kind of through this film, um, swinging through the, the set, like as, as I was, I, I, I kind of began um, the film while kind of 
producing all of the scans and it, it was it was kind of through through the way I was like how can I kind of like play with like showing a walkthrough but also like how you could like fall into this digital space and that's kind of like why it it, it starts off with the bird eye view and that's kind of like why I kind of like play with this language as well of 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 rather than using plan it's the bird eye view that you kind of fall into the space and um I think this is one of the things that's super fascinating in gaming engines as well that you can really play with the physics of your mm. space where you you could even give like kind of no gravity in a certain space so everything kind of floats and things like that so I don't know if it's if it's exactly like western architectural kind of modeling that it's um opposing but I guess it's like all types of ideas of of um how you would experience a site or um I think um in in the the gaming engine um, particularly Unity is, is what I work in, where you know um, you can like fall fall through your terrain. In this in this particular piece, I didn't have um, a terrain; it was just kind of floating through. But I've developed the project since then, where like the the character has a weight and mm. walks through the the space and bumps into the scans as they, everything has given um, some type of physics as well. So I guess. Um, it was it, it was a, a, a very kind of instant um, process initially um, with with kind of critiquing how I well not critiquing but playing with how I would show this digital um, form in all the kind of like experience kind of architectural ways of, of going through a project but then now um, I'm really thinking about it of more a physical way of um, of uh, if you know the, the the surfaces were bouncy, how the the player walking through the space would like bounce off an object, and um, I think that's that's pretty um, kind of exciting and more something that's maybe suited to to VR and and stuff. But I think um, another another thing is um, how um, you would experience sound within the mm. space as well and um, Again, this wasn't shown in the film I showed just now because that was from 2019. But since then, I also think that um, when I when I present um, that digital space, having um, a sound that's far away that you can like travel to, is um, a way that I would want to like kind of present an architectural project instead of um, so so you you have an idea of distance or, or being able to travel. And I think that also comes from um, the final project, which was uh, about the talking drums and how mm. we communicate through the rivers as well. So I think that's another kind of concept of um, what architectural modeling could be is kind of through the sound of, of the space rather mm. than the actual representation of like, this is what would be to the right. And, you know, this is it at a 150 or whatever kind of dimension. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question, but it, it's all kind of um, trying to think of other ways how I could represent that experience, I guess. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that's that's so uh, fascinating because, you know, often we have, and I think you mentioned it also in regards to the sort of Unreal uh, engine uh, as platforms, they're often sort of regarded as this sort of uh, uh, new sort of uh, uh let's say uh, um, uh, democratic platforms where the biases and the kind of uh, uh, modes of visions and the systems of powers that have been sort of implemented in the past are cut off and uh, sort of uh, neutralized in this new platforms when instead like you were describing very clearly sort of are uh, just sort of uh, reproducted and redeveloped through this sort of new, this new sort of uh, immersive or dynamic or whatnot sort of uh, environment and being able to develop uh, a glitch or some sort of uh, uh, resistance to those, uh, to those embedded kind of strategies. 
uh, uh, and not taking that, those for granted. I think that's uh, really inspiring. Um, I'm glad you picked on the sound as well because it's something that uh, uh, I always find extremely fascinating and all the media artists that we brought uh, to speak about their work, they seem to be sort of like a really, really big focus on, on that as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as the project. Um, I love in the, in the passageway in the plaza, and I promise I'm gonna shut up after this, but I love the fact that the, the, the way that you keep talking about the swinging of the camera and sort of avoiding sort of frontal representation and planimetry representation, et cetera, uh, happens in this sort of like frantic kind of uncontrolled way, right? But the sound has some sort of loop that repeats. I don't know if I made that up or sort of like as this kind of uh, known elements that seem to sort of create a rhythm that yeah almost guides you through the space, even though everything I see and I experience is kind of gi giving me a different impression. So I think that that's really beautiful. Um, uh, like I said, I, I could keep going, but is there any other question um, from the audience? I really don't want to monopolize this. Uh, go for it. This is someone raising their hand. Eduardo, go for it. Uh, hi. Um, I actually just have a simple question, actually. Uh, do you think there's a difference between, you know, uh, intentional glitches, or at least, you know, it, uh, intentional accidents, if that makes sense, on how we use uh, the platforms of, you know, uh, of how we model stuff? Um, for example, um, you know, yeah, for example, as you said, like there's like blobs in your models, right? <clears throat> in some ways, they are like accidental, I guess, but you know, in, in some ways, you could also argue that they are intentional because you want them to be there. Um, so I was just wondering if, if there's a difference between what you're doing and then, you know, with uh, other people who are trying to create. Um, something that is more perfect, but there's a glitch on it. Do you think there's like a difference between um, uh, your kind of glitch and their kind of glitch, if that makes sense? Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think, um, so initially, like when I, when I started working, you know, I just, I just kind of wanted to like have a digital like scan and then um, it comes back that, if you're, if, if someone moves, so saying if I scanned myself right now and I was still, but then I suddenly like moved my head, my head would kind of disappear. Um, and, you know, that that was, so it, it was clear that the, I, I was particularly using um, photo scan at the time um, and photo scan, um, it, it is known that it was kind of like more tested on, buildings and sculptures it's not really advised for it to be used in a busy market or or for someone that's dancing and things like that so that um it wasn't like an intentional glitch and I kind of I viewed these markets as like public spaces so I kind of thought that maybe it would work but it also there are other kind of difficulties that come from it which are distance and um, phone quality and time that you have to develop the um, the scan as well so actually I ended up um, I, I don't know if it's purposeful but I started developing scans on low resolution or like the lowest kind of setting just because of energy and time and everything it takes in to make these per like perfect scans but I think that um, once you once you start scanning you will realize that there um, is like an environment that these scans have been like tested for and that are really kind of provided for. Um, I, uh, I'm not too sure like um, what the differences do at, at this moment in time because it is a software that is like kind of being developed in a very kind of particular kind of structural way so I think any way that it's used where it is like misunderstood um or or comes out um you know it will say that there's zero resolution so it can't kind of like function I I kind of feel as though um it, it, it's kind of a glitch if you decide it's a glitch I guess like there's some people that would say that this is a mistake or there's some people that could say that you know this was like exactly what you wanted I, I wanted to show 
like there was only voids within this space because the software doesn't understand. So it's really like kind of up to you. Um, like I've, I've been doing many scans um, over the past three years. And I remember the first scan that I ever did was actually so, like the technician like scanning my head. And um, what I found fascinating is that like my face came up, but my hair didn't because it, the, the way that the um, software works is that it, you know, if there's something that's like kind of super like dark, it will literally like won't even like like understand the measurements because it's 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 all done by overlapping imagery measurements light all of these types of things and so there was a really kind of interesting scan that was just my head with just a void around like kind of like you could if in the rhino um software you could like go and look at the back of my kind of inside of my face and things like that and I kind of um I don't know if it's a glitch um I don't know if it's like purposeful I don't know if I'm answering this question right <laughs> but um but I think it's really up to, to you with what the purpose of your scan is I guess please let me know if, if you want me to like articulate a particular point because I'm not sure if I I really understood no I mean I think it makes sense because like a lot of stuff that we do in art I guess it's more like um, do you want this to be a mistake or not, right? Like a lot of things in art, it seems like that. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't know. Um, thank you, I guess. for <laughs> You should definitely try it. Do you do, you, do you scanning of any type? Uh, well, I guess the most recent thing that I've done is, um, well, I, I tried to do like um, 3D modeling in Rhino. Um, but I was trying to play with a, a command called patch, uh, which basically just takes contour um, and then, you know, makes like a, a land mass on it. Um, mm -hmm. But then, you know, I was trying to do like very specific things on it. Um, and I just played with the setting and stuff like that to try to create in some, in some ways like a perfect, uh, you know, the perfect way to like dip and stuff like that. Um, but yeah but yeah i mean a lot of those stuff are like uh, in some ways it's out of my control right because it's the, just the way how the program works um so, so I, yeah i was just wondering about you know if those mistakes are like well you know yeah like yeah like how do you consider those um glitches i guess that's what i was wondering <laughs> well um Ibi, i think we also uh we did a photogrammetry workshop uh, a couple of weeks ago and okay. you made me feel really terrible because my presentation of the uh, software was all about how to make a perfect scan so like now <laughs> i have to do a whole new version on like yeah <laughs> understand how it works and then like break it because i think yeah. it's uh, i completely agree with you it's it's really uh it's really important to be able to to control and misuse the technology when uh, when it's necessary. Yeah, um, it would be hilarious. Like I, I obviously I, every like everyone, I I learn how to do all of the stuff from YouTube, and it would just be really hilarious to see a YouTube video of like how not to do a perfect scan. Like you never <laughs> you never see a sentence like that, but um, that would be really great. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, so I don't want to uh, go over time. Uh, but if possible, I would love to throw one last uh, question in the ring. Uh, specifically, I, I was very um, was very fascinating in the uh, fascinated about the project on uh, in Ethiopia about the secret forests uh, and to see kind of a, even in the way that you were talking and also in the in the methodology of the project, it was sort of like a clear shift of, uh, I mean, maybe I'm misrepresenting, but my understanding of this is sort of like your positioning towards the objects and the sites that you were scanning. I think you said something beautiful about um, to create just sort of soft impression, not a sort of a definitive recording of those sites as a respect for the kind of, uh, uh, sacred qualities that they had, but also the kind of uh, distance that existed between you as an observer and the uh, site with its own histories and all. And so I'm wondering, um, 
you know, uh, this is, I think, is a very, very uh, peculiar question to ask to, to, to extend to sort of like our group, right? Like as a group of uh, students that come from all over the world and try to uh, photograph, sketch, draw, 3D scan sites that are um, here in Italy, for example, um, uh, in the kind of distance, sort of recognizing the distance that exists between the viewer and those sites. And so I'm wondering if you, um, you know, I would like to know more about how you dealt with that and the, the kind of uh, motivations or moments where you felt it was okay to get closer and, 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 and moments where distance was required and, and, and how, how that sort of made you feel or, or, or how you went about sort of arranging those kind of positions. Yeah, um, yeah, it was it was a really interesting experience, and I think um, um, particularly um, to Bryce's question earlier as well. Um, I was definitely like very noticeable in Ethiopia, I guess, because like I and I felt like I was kind of it was the first time I had been commissioned to do a piece and a research project in like a space where I didn't know. Like I'm mm. very kind of like aware that I. Um, and feel a little bit uncomfortable in going to, into other people's spaces. So going to Ethiopia, where I'd never been before, I'm not East African, I was very kind of aware of this. And I think that um, there are like kind of tourist um, kind of uh, routes that you can take to, to go visit the, the sacred forests. Um, a lot of people kind of do religious pilgrimage and pilgrimages there and like um, I, me and my partner, we we were there, but we went to many different sites. And I think that we were just, we're also not religious as well. So we kind of felt a little bit as intruders into space. And I think the closer we got into the sacred forest, the closer that we got to the, um, the, the kind of like actual like architectural structures of, of the church, um, the more kind of um, aware we were that we shouldn't go further. We felt very like, content in the forest area and then when it came to like um scanning um the forest area I was actually working with videos as well which made it more of like a fluid kind of experience rather than I'm trying to like kind of capture every detail with it, each individual photograph it was more just like essentially kind of like um capturing like the sounds of the birds and and the the leaves moving and um it, it wasn't something that I realized until I got there is that that's how I'm going to have to approach this project and, I, and also I wasn't too sure how I, I didn't really have a plan of how I was going to approach the project because it was such an unfamiliar space and when it came to um, when we would have a site visit and then come back to, to, to do some work it just felt appropriate to kind of work in um, kind of creating these enclaves and more um, kind of allowing the geometry to decide what the kind of models would be and um, more of like an impression of a space rather than an actual like study of you know mm. this is exactly where people pray this is where people have tea and although um, everyone was super inviting and and the um, kind of Ethiopian coffee ceremony is like a huge part. Everyone is so open to like inviting you into their homes, and particularly in Bahada, where, where we were. But um, it just felt um, very imposing to, to kind of like, you know, then create like a scan of, of the sacred space. So I think traces was the appropriate um, way to go forward. And I think there's a really interesting essay um, about opacity, um, I've forgotten. Um, the complete title, but I think playing with opacity and 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 um, like um, a vision of a space is really interesting. Of 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 how how much you see of a space. I think in order to kind of um, have respect for the people who are there, or or especially if you're an outsider of that site, or if it's a sacred site as well. Um, I don't know if you know the opacity. Um, no I, no I don't I don't recall the essay but if at any point it comes back yeah. to mind you, you feel free to send it it will be yeah awesome. I need to look that up sorry no don't worry no but it was really great uh, um, and uh, like I said super 
uh, super inspiring lecture and the conversation was uh, uh, left me with lots of um, questions and thoughts uh, on how to move forward. So this is uh, all that one can ask from a, from a lecture. So really, thank you so much for uh, for joining us for for your availability and willingness to share your work. And uh, I hope that we'll be able to well, keep in touch and uh, see each other uh, somewhat in person with all of these pixel faces uh, very soon. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all the interesting questions. I, I need to like kind of think of better answers. Damn. But yeah, next time. Um, they were really, really um, inspiring questions and um, definitely things to consider. And thank you for your time as well. All right. Awesome. Um, well, take care. And for everyone else, um, we, uh, we will uh, follow up with more information for next week, uh, for tomorrow and for next week. And then we, um, uh, yeah, we're excited to uh, the rest of the semester together. Bye, Bia. Take care. Take care, everyone. Oh, thank you. Bye. Ciao, Lindsay. Lindsay. <laughs>